it's nonfiction November. So I thought I'd talk today about a book that I recently finished before November started. Um, and that book is Code Girls by Eliza Mundy. This book is about the lives of female codebreakers in America during World War II. And I just adored it. Um, I thought it was great. I gave it five out of five stars and I highly recommend it to everyone. This book came out in October of 2017, so two years ago, and I really think that now is a great time to read it because um, right now in particular, um, most World War II veterans are quite frankly dying and because due to the nature of code breaking, these women could not say what they did during the war. And so their even their husbands and their children just thought they were secretaries and they never got to say what they did. So because of that most of them never received any recognition. And I think for their work, which saved, you know, thousands of lives and for their tirelessness and their dedication, um, to be recognized before they die, I think is very important. So I'm really grateful that this book came out now, uh, better late than never. <laughs> Mundy does a really great job of combining historical facts with personal lived experiences, which is something that I really look for in historical nonfiction um, or nonfiction about a historical time period. Um, I not only were there constant, like, was there was it so informational, but I also felt like I understood lots of the personal lives about the women who lived this. Uh, I felt very connected to them. I was rooting for them. I was so invested in their futures. They just felt so real to me. Uh, and because of that, I think the author did a great job. She interviewed um, many of the women who are still living or who were still living when she wrote this book. And near the end, she talks about what happened to them after the war and how lots of them became housewives because they had to leave the workforce, and but some of them didn't, and they chose careers, and so they forgoed having, forwent, forgoed, one of those. Um, and so they gave up having children, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, way back during the early months of World War II, the Navy and the Army realized that code breaking would be an essential part of the war, and they basically had no, um, no military infrastructure to do it. So what um, the Navy did was they um, began recruiting um, uh, elite young women from women's colleges and training them in the art of code breaking. And the army took a slightly different route. They were a little bit less classist and they recruited school teachers. And it turns out that school teachers were very adept at code breaking. If you were a woman in the 40s or the 30s and you did not want to get married for whatever reason and you had to support yourself, really the only line of work available to you was to become a school teacher. Um, and so there were thousands of bored school teachers who were desperate to leave the profession um, during this time, and many of them pounced on this opportunity. A lot of them did not even know the job that they were signing up for, uh, but they thought it would be an adventure, and they moved to Washington. And as the war progressed, um, and obviously it turned out that it was not going to be over within a matter of weeks, um, it became rapidly apparent that they needed more and more and more code breakers, and so both the Army and the Navy could not recruit fast enough, and young women were constantly pouring, um, pouring into Washington to work as code breakers, uh, and they outnumbered the men, I think, what was it, like three or four to one um, by the end of the war. Um, at some point, they realized that having all these civilians handling very highly classified military information was a security risk, and the waves and the wax had just been formed, so um, uh, all the female code breakers were given the option of enlisting or commissioning in the army or the navy because their work was so crucial. And that changed a lot of their lives uh, because obviously going from being a civilian who works with the military to being in the military, there's a pretty big difference there and there's a new set of restrictions. And um, 
this was very new for the country um, and for the new waves and wax they received a mixed response uh, many mixed responses um, a lot of women did it because they had brothers fighting overseas and they wanted to help. Some did it because they had no brothers and they wanted to represent their family in the military during, you know, one of the biggest wars America has ever seen. And they wanted to be a part of something and they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to end the war. Um, and some people, some civilians were incredibly supportive, but sometimes uh, women would yell at them because, uh, at this time, women could not be in combat, so they were taking over some of the more, um, uh, some of the other job, like desk jobs that would free up men to like go to the front. And so some mothers of soldiers were not happy that um, that women were taking some of the safer jobs, potentially away from their sons. Uh, and oftentimes, men in the military did not take them seriously and uh, would laugh at them. Due to the nature of the female codebreakers' work, they could not discuss what they were doing, they could not let anything slip, they could, um, because if any of the Axis spies um, figured out how extensive the Allied codebreaking operation were, they would change all the ciphers, and uh, basically their communications would go dark. And obviously that would be incredibly, um, harmful to the Allied military operation. Uh, so because of that, it was very crucial for these female codebreakers to basically um, uh, continue this ruse that they were very, um, that they were, um, that they did very menial tasks. Um, they constantly um, were projecting the narrative that they were secretaries, that what they did was they emptied waste baskets and typed up document, typed up unimportant documents and sat on officers' laps. There was one moment where a woman who was a wave was walking home from work and she, um, and it was pouring rain and there was a policy at the time that civilians would offer military members uh, rides in their vehicles. So a car pulled over and offered her a ride and she accepted and he constantly grilled her about what was the nature of your work and why, what do you really do and why can't you tell me and what does the Q on your badge stand for? And she was, you know, very evasive, um, very self-deprecating. She said, you know, I'm a secretary and I, and I empty waste baskets and I do, um, and I do tasks around the office. Um, and then he goes, you know, well, what does the Q on your badge stand for? And she said, oh, it stands for communications. You know how the Navy can't spell. Ha ha ha. And, um, and then when she was being let out of the car, the driver pulled, um, reached over to reached over to open the door for her and she saw underneath his coat that he had the I, I don't know what they're called but like the gold bands around the um, uh, underneath his coat on the sleeve of his jacket which meant that he was an admiral in the Navy so obviously he knew what she really did and he had been testing her and she had passed. Uh, just little things like that, little stories that um, really brought this whole, that really brought this whole book to life um, uh, and made it so much more personal than just dry facts. The military really um, needed women as code breakers mostly because men didn't want to do it um, and women were seen as natural code breakers because code breaking is very like tedious detail-oriented work and that's what women at the time were thought to be good at and in addition to that um, code breaking while it is very important it is not very glamorous and uh, in the military often how you get promoted is by distinguishing yourself through combat and obviously you don't want to have your code breakers on the front combat lines because that would just jeopardize the whole operation. So they're often very safely in um, home territory, uh, which leaves little opportunity for glory, which leaves little opportunity for military promotion, which means that most military men do not want to do code breaking. So they had to get women to do it. Um, and they were responsible for 
so many victories. Um, like even D-Day was um, ultimately came, ultimately was partially successful due to the um, fake traffic which these women were generating to imply that there were um, other armies stationed at different parts of Europe, which meant that Hitler um, did not send his full force um, into, uh, did not send his full force in. Um, and they had to be very analytical about it because fake traffic had to look just like real traffic. Um, so the point being is that the work that they were doing was crucial and they never got credit for it. <laughs> and only, I think like 60 years after the war or something crazy like that, did the NSA say, Hey, you can actually say what you did. And most of them didn't even talk about it then because it felt wrong to them at that, like to say it after having kept it a secret after all this time. And so that's part of the reason why I really appreciated this book because I think giving credit where credit is due and appreciating all that they did for, um, all that they did to, uh, contribute to the Allied victory during the war was just so crucial. Um, the author Liza Mundy does go into a little bit of detail about how, um, about how sexuality and race did severely limit many women from being code breakers. Um, although I would have appreciated a little bit more information. She did talk about how um, black women were not permitted to, um, to be waves and serve in the Navy. Um, and it was due to basically just pure racism um, because the, the, um, there was one Navy officer who said that he was worried that it would harm like unity and he was worried about their loyalty to America basically. Um, they were allowed to serve in the army uh, and be code breakers for the army, however they were often relegated to more menial tasks. Um, as far as sexuality goes, um, some women when it was uh, revealed that they were lesbians were kicked out, um, whereas other women hid their sexu sexuality for decades even, um, to continue doing government work, um, and secretly lived with female partners only for it, the secret to come out after their deaths. So I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about the struggles that non-white women and that, uh, um, non-heterosexual women face during this time. Um, but ultimately though, I was very happy with, um, with, the book and my only other criticism is that it made me so dissatisfied with my own life because I now think that my current life is super boring. Yes, so again, five out of five stars to Code Girls by Liza Mundy. I was very happy with it and I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in history or the role of women during wartime or World War II. And yeah, if you have read this book, let me know. I would love to hear from you and I will see you all next time. Bye!